So the medieval period starts just at the end or the fall of the Roman Empire and carries us all the way into the Renaissance, almost a thousand years later. So as the longest period of music, it really represents a cultural journey made by the people in this time. In medieval England, the church was the dominating figure over life. And this rise of Catholicism not just influenced, but entirely defined early medieval music. This music was monophonic, or having a single melody, and was made of almost entirely chants made for the church. The most notable of which was, of course, the Gregorian chant, which is playing above. This piece uses modality, or a 12-tone scale, and is the first recorded to expand on the church's rigid structure of music. By the turn of the 12th century, composer Hildegard von Biggen was able to push the boundaries even further with his own religious works. Around the same time, though, Western music is starting to shift from monophonic to polyphonic, or having multiple melodies. Polyphony will eventually take over monophony, and in later eras, define non-secular music. Shortly after, the troubadour mini-singers arrive singing secular love songs and dividing late medieval music into secular and non-secular. A famous composer of the former being Monet Diaros, whose music is now playing, and later Adam de la Halle. On the religious side of things, composers Leonin and Perotin dominated in the church, as well as Guillaume, which is a shockingly common first name, de Machuat. Throughout all this time, medieval art never wavered in its representation of the Catholic Church. Beginning with sculptures and mosaics and ending with Gothic architecture and artworks, the art wasn't as influenced by the factors that caused medieval music to change. Some say that the divergence of secular and non-secular music began the end of the medieval time period. This was probably caused by the different cultural currents of Europe forming, leading music to become more cosmopolitan and reflect what was happening in society, much like the Renaissance did. This cultural infusion led to polyphonic music evolving into music with one harmonized melody that dominated secularly as the medieval time period ended and made way for the Renaissance. Okay, moving into the Renaissance, 1400s. Renaissance, of course, meaning rebirth. Cultural rebirth, artistic rebirth, political, economic, a rebirth of everything. The very first thing the Renaissance did was really define the lines between religious and non-religious music, because during this time, the actual structure of the two types was different. The church held on to polyphony, while secular music evolved with the times and became more harmonic. This secular music really began to push the boundaries, and this time period really laid the foundation for functional harmony and having major and minor keys. This music was mostly vocal and focused a lot on emotion. This is a more representation of this time period, as the Renaissance was a time of deep expression. Music without any vocals at all was also sprouted during this time. As this was a time of expression, the arts really thrived, with the works of, just to name a few, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael arising during this period. So it's only fitting that all these new innovations arised in music as well. Another new discovery was modal music, But not everyone was for these new, what some would consider radical ideas. So during the late 1500s, the Pope's counter-reformation really took back the concept of quote-unquote pure music and rejected the new Renaissance ideas. To start, he eliminated all instruments but the organ to maintain vocal purity. He got rid of secular harmony and folk melody and commissioned Palestrina to save polyphony with pieces such as the one that you're hearing right now. He was a very controversial figure, to say the least. The divide between these two musical modes of thought was pretty fitting, as historically this was a time of great turmoil, with the Protestant Reformation and War of Roses taking place. But as these things died down and the mood of the world shifted, the Renaissance came to a close, marked by many with the invention of the opera. Hundreds, the Baroque period. Okay, here we go. Now things are getting more familiar. Bach, Vivaldi, Handel, the Baroque period birthed music we still know and music theory we still study. Politics, science, and art were all moving forward at this time. With the Thirty Year War raging, Galileo and Newton dissecting and beginning to understand our world, and great artists like Remembrant and Caravaggio developing never before seen techniques for visual art. New musical techniques and structures were parallelly created. Baroque style had new and innovative musical structures with lots of ornamentation. You can see here that use as trills and runs to ornament the piece. 
This makes sense, as fancy, expensive authorities were thrown, and social classes were very important. The flamboyancy of Baroque culture is directly reflected through its music. As previously mentioned, the development of opera was also a crucial point. Here's Monteverdi, the most influential early Baroque composer's opera, Orphea, which is an excellent example of early Baroque form and Baroque music being used to tell a story. So what new structures were made during this time? Well, once Bach, whose music is playing above, and Handel came around, they totally dominated alongside Vivaldi. They solidified composers like Monteverdi's ideas and made the Baroque period one of tonality and contrast. Throwing out the Renaissance's modality, they turned to major and minor scale tones. This structure we still use today. With this base, complex structures like the fuse were able, like the fugue was able to be made, were able to be made. Here's one of Handel's. Basically, they really liked intertwining multiple melodies and having them form one logical piece, made possible by the music theory nailed down by Bach and others during this time. They also used lots of contrast, like here in. Overall, this was a very influential time, with Bach essentially creating modern music theory that the next generation of composers eventually used to create new works of art. Bach's death is generally regarded as the end of the period he helped construct, and so 1750 sees people tire of the excessive embellishments of Baroque and enter the classical era. In all aspects of life during this time, people began reverting to simpler times, if you will. European culture suddenly became dominated by an imitation of ancient, quote-unquote, classical times. It's interesting because Baroque translates directly to weird or strange, while classical is derived from words to do with order and balance. So not only were a row of embellishments abandoned, but these new simple works had clear, balanced structure and compositional division. Haydn's flute sonata now playing is an example of how classical works utilize clear cadences and the four bar phrases we've learned about in class. So before the classical era, most pieces had an improvised continual part, and much music was up to interpretation. Classical composers did away with this, specif specifying what instruments were meant to play what pieces, as well as incorporating phrasing and dynamic markings. I just find it interesting because so many consider the Baroque period to be rigid and structured, yet classical changed it by making it rigid and structured. Other changes included the piano over harpsichord and larger orchestras. Plus quartets? There were so many influential composers in this time period. So as Schubert begins to play, let's revisit the phonies. We have monophony, polyphony, and now classical music popularizes homophony. The foundation of basically every song ever. It's essentially a melody line over a chord progression or a chord-based line. All of these things paved the way for the sonata, concerto, and most importantly, symphony. You know him, you love him, here's Mozart. This is a sonata, or a solo for one instrument. This doesn't seem very special, but trust me, it was a novelty. Mozart also wrote many concertos, which arose from the newfound popularity of the, of the orchestra where one would be used to accompany and ground a flamboyant soloist. The biggest classical achievement, though, was the symphony, a big wave of music for the whole orchestra. Their length and instrumental variety allowed for deep and varied expression through music. While Haydn really started and gave root to the symphony, Beethoven took it and expanded it into something great. Here's his most famous symphony, Beethoven's Fifth. It should al I should also mention the glaring use of motive, which was around for quite some time at this point, but was never used with such efficiency as seen here. The expression of Beethoven's symphonies made him a sort of bridge between the Romantic and Classical periods, adding along the rebirth of operas being more dramatic than ever. Many, including me, really consider the Romantic period to be a genre of late classical music rather than its own time period. So let's talk about it. So the Romantic period. As I mentioned, classical music was all about restraint. The Romantics really stripped back those restraints to allow for something more, more emotional and expressive. Many don't consider this its own musical movement, as it was really just building on the structures of the classical times while being swept up in the mainly literary Romantic movement. This was a time of poetry, art, and philosophy, with some of the works of William Blake and Goya coming along at this time. So the music began to emulate that, striving for big emotional pieces and individuality. But why the shift? Many equate it to the rise of the middle class, 
Before, composers and orchestras were for small groups of the high class, maybe commissioned by a king or some sort of nobility. But with this middle class rise, orchestras performed in public for the people. Thus, it makes sense that the music would be a reflection of the struggles of the ordinary man, instead of the sophistication of the nobility. Schubert was once again influential in this period, as well as Weber and Chopin and Liszt. New structures of this period included the Rhapsody and Nocturne. In general, everything was more and bigger, a bigger range of pitches, more range of dynamics, more elaborate melodies, more instruments in the orchestra. Liszt's Piano Sonata is a good example of this. As the slave trade infused African culture into music and time passed, late Romantic composers, including Tchaikovsky, Mahler, and Sibelius, built on this early foundation and expanded on it with extended chromatic harmony based on movement from tonic to subdominant or other unstandard progressions. One new thing from the Romantics was program music, or music describing a place and time. All of Tchaikovsky's ballets are a great example of this, like the Nutcracker. It takes Liszt's form, the symphonic poem, a one-movement orchestral work based on literature, and expands upon it to make great art. Overall, the Romantic period was a great time where, thanks to the culture and new technologies, artists were given free range to express their ideas. Unfortunately, though, this came to an end with the onset of World War I. We're almost there, the 20th and 21st centuries. So the 1900s onward are really interesting because after World War I, music diverged into tons of unique genres. We'll briefly go over some of them now. First, the jazz movement from New Orleans. Here's the great Louis Armstrong play. It comes with blues, swung notes, and polyphonic improvisation. So jazz is really interesting because it's where we start to see music really being, just as it was beginning to in the Romantic period, taken back by the people. It wasn't something just for the nobles, it wasn't jumping just for the rich, it was something that a whole community could rally around, and it really reflects the soul of African American culture at this time period. It's also the only American-born genre. Then of course, there's Impressionism and Modernism. Debussy was the king of the former, which includes static harmony and just a general lack of motion, to be honest. The latter was born after World War I as a time of experimentation and search for new musical form. So we all learned about 12-tone music in class, but essentially this genre uses a 12-tone scale and you can't repeat any of the notes until all of them have been played at least once. It's rock. Rock is characterized by a band of mainly electrical instruments, and so much memorable music has come from this diverse genre. ACDC, Queen, The Beatles, Led Zeppelin, so many amazing musicians were born from this genre. But rock music is really interesting because, along with jazz and later pop, it really divided the musical landscape into regular music and classical music. So basically, any orchestral music, so basically all of the music that we've seen up until this point, was all rolled together into classical and labeled kind of separate from what was quote-unquote regular music, while all of these other genres like rock and jazz and pop became mainstream, normal. Yet, thanks to the diversity of our musical landscape, classical music has not yet disappeared. So looking at the time period as a whole, we can see that music has evolved to the point where our society has evolved. Our society as a whole is more connected than ever before, but it's also more diverse than ever before. And the musical landscape is the same.